Welcome to The Other Web. Our guest today is Kelly McBride. Kelly is a journalist and an ethicist. She works with newsrooms everywhere on their ethical standards. She's a senior vice president at the Pointer Institute, a journalism think tank. She is the chair of the Craig Newmark Center for Ethics and Leadership, and she is also the public editor at NPR. Kelly, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. So about 10 years ago, you co-wrote a book called The New Ethics of Journalism, Principles for the 21st Century. So maybe let's start with the broadest possible question. What are the principles of ethics in journalism? <laughs> well, we could spend like 10 hours talking about that um, because there's there's this misunderstanding that like there are these universal set of ethics in journalism and there really are not at all. There have been various efforts over the decades of professional journalists and influential people in the industry getting together and saying, hey, we think these are our ethics. A couple notable examples are in the early 1980s, there was a reporter at the Washington Post who basically fabricated a story. Um, her name was Janet Cook. The story was called Jimmy's World. It was about um, a child heroin addict. And um, she won a Pulitzer Prize for it, which was rescinded when um, it was discovered that she had first made up a bunch of things on her resume, and then um, the rest of the story unraveled pretty quickly. In the wake of that, um, a bunch of leaders in journalism, so like um, there was a group at the time called um, ASNE, American Society of Newspaper Editors, some leaders within that, some people here at the Pointer Institute, um, which was a fairly young organization then, some people at the Society for Professional Journalists, they all got together and said, could we articulate a set of standards or principles? And so there were a bunch of conversations and a bunch of meetings and a bunch of writing back and forth. And they came up with, that gathering um, came up with the standards, seek the truth and report it as fully as possible, act independently, and minimize harm. The Society for Professional Journalists then added a fourth, be accountable. Um, and those have really served as the bedrock. Um, the um, radio, television, news directors association glommed onto that. Many news organizations, as they wrote their own ethics policies, mimicked that wording. And so those really were throughout the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, those were the principles that most people pointed to when they said, these are the ethics of journalism. Now, the thing is, is the way that you applied those, there was no universality at all. And in fact, um, because we're an unlicensed profession, every single newsroom has to figure out what that means and what their specific standards are around seeking the truth, acting independently, minimizing harm. And um, they all came up with different standards, right? And, and the way we know that is because a lot of us journalists went from one newsroom to another and discovered that like, oh, like our standards for anonymous sources in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which is a newspaper I worked at at one point, were X. Um, and then when I went across the country and worked at the Spokesman Review in Spokane, Washington, the standards were different. And even within newsrooms, right? Like I noticed that like our standards in the sports department were really different than our standards in the news department for anonymous sources. So there were never, it's not like the medical profession or the legal profession where because those professions are licensed, there are these bodies that identify standards and then actual behaviors and what a violation of the standard would look like. And then they enforce it, right? Like, like maybe not universally. I bet a lot of people get away with stuff in both of those professions, but they have ways of like, if you violate a standard and it comes to somebody's attention, they have these boards that can punish you, take your license away, fine you, make you go through some sort of education process. Right. 
And, and journalism has none of that. So the standards were um, seek the truth, report it as fully as possible, act independently, minimize harm. I think the standards now are very different. And in that book, I argue that with the internet, we a couple of things happened. One is a bunch of people who were like journalism adjacent started participating in the distribution of news. Um, and then the other thing that happened is, is we could talk to the people who were consuming news. We could create a feedback loop that was much more illuminating. And what the citizens told us, right? So what people, what people told us when we, when we did the work that we put into that book is that whole act independently, consumers and news don't know what that is, right? And they don't care. But what they want is transparency. They want to know what your point of view is, who you take money from, how you, how you decide what you do. And journalists still aren't very good at being transparent. And then that whole minimize harm, they don't like that either, citizens and news consumers. And instead, what they like is they recognize that choices that we make in journalism about how we tell stories, which stories we tell, who we talk to, that all of those can impact various communities. And what they, what, what consumers of news don't like is when the news harms their particular community. And so that might be um, a religious community. It might be an ethnic community. It might be a rural community. It might be a, a community that has a certain affinity like gun owners or something like that. So people really perceive that the news hurts them in specific ways and they want to talk about that. So there's a lot that I can try to unpack here, but the first thing that jumped at me is this minimize harm thing, because I'm immediately thinking about the quintessential fourth estate role of exposing corruption in government. And if it works and it causes an upheaval of some sort, didn't you just create harm? You didn't right. minimize harm, right? You created harm, but it's good. It kind of exposed the truth, right? Yeah. I mean, it's really minimize unnecessary harm. Um, so like a classic example is if you're writing a story that involves vulnerable people like children or immigrants, you may somehow seek the truth, right? So tell the truth. You will tell the story, but you might, you might cloak their identities in a way that the audience wouldn't be able to easily track them down you know, a sort of classic example um, and, and one that really goes back about 50 years in journalism is um, we most of the time don't name victims of rape. And that actually grows out of an effort in the 60s and 1970s where women's groups identified that rape is the least reported crime. And the reason that it isn't reported very often is because of the level of stigma and shame that come along with it. And so news organizations adopted, many of them adopted a standard that said, okay, we won't identify rape victims um, specifically because we want to encourage them to report the crime to law enforcement. So there's, there's many examples of minimizing harm, but yeah, it's not do no harm, right? It's not like the medical profession. And I would argue the medical profession that they don't really embrace that do no harm either. Certainly not with the number of deaths in the U.S. from the wrong medication being prescribed or from things like that. But it's interesting. So the rape example is a really positive application of this rule. I think most people would probably agree that not naming mass shooters is another positive application of this rule. Mm -hmm. But then you have extreme cases where, and now the BBC will refuse to call terrorists terrorists. It's kind of a weird application of this rule, right? I mean, who's harmed by that? I don't know, but I thought that their assumption was that calling them terrorists harms a community, therefore they won't do it. No, that's not that's not an accurate that's that's not an accurate description of why they won't do it. Okay, so can can you correct me? Yeah, I'm sure, sure. <laughs> so the reason that they won't do it is because it is a political term that is determined by specific government organizations, mm -hmm. and um, historically there have been times when it has been applied in fairly 
manipulative, derogatory ways, right? Like determining that Nelson Mandela was a terrorist or Martin Mm -hmm. Luther King was a terrorist. And so the idea that you would just parrot a government proclamation that has been used for political means in the past is why they won't parrot the term. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't describe acts of terrorism, right? And even call them acts of terrorism. It just means that they won't blanket, always preface describing a certain group as a terrorist group. Um, it, the, the audience should still be able to figure out, one, that governments call these groups terrorists, and two, that um, there's activities that these groups are clearly responsible for that are acts of terrorism. And I don't think anybody who's watching the BBC walks away being unclear about any of that or reads the Associated Press or listens to national public radio, right? Like there's lots and lots of news organizations that use that and people get really upset about it. But um, the thing is, is you really don't want your journalists just parroting government officials. No, I, I agree with that. I can send you some examples if you want of cases where I think the BBC did not apply the benign version of this policy that you just described, right? Where it was clearly an article that neglected to mention the most important facts about the people they're describing. So, and specifically, I have some qualms with the BBC on that, right? With the AP, I don't have that kind of complaint, for example. Well, and that's probably because the BBC does more work in a specific region that you're talking about. Well, AP is pretty active in Gaza, for example, right now, right? Um, But with BBC, they've had more articles that I've seen. And again, I run a news aggregator, so I see a lot of Mm -hmm. articles, right? I saw at some point that the BBC is just near Al Jazeera and how it describes events. And it's not just the use of terminology. The use of terminology seems to be a part of a broader positioning that is that was selected, I guess, by their editorial staff, right? You know what I would love to do, be, and I don't follow the BBC, right? Because as much as I as much as I follow the AP and um, National Public Radio, who I actually have a job following, mm-hmm. um, but um, I would love to go back to the Palestine Mandate and track the BBC's language over time, because I I just gotta believe. That there's that there are historical influences that inform. I mean, I love nerding out over language and the way that that different cultures use words to describe events and to signal um, to audiences. And so, I would really love to go back yeah. to that because. Yeah. No, I think that would be a really fun comparison. A fun comparison that I do essentially ever since October seventh is to compare Channel Four to the BBC. They're both funded by the UK government in various ways, right? The funding mechanism is different, but essentially the funder is almost exactly the same. And yet they tend to describe things in very different ways. And it's kind of comical sometimes to observe how. Mm, See, and I don't watch Channel 4 at all. (laughs) Right. Well, again, this is my life right now. Good job. Yeah, it, it was my hobby to be an information junkie and now it became my job. Um, but it's also interesting to see which outlets drifted in the opposite direction. Like I would argue that the Wall Street Journal right now looks a lot like the Jerusalem Post on this topic, oh, which really? I, I would not expect three years ago. But just the editorial pages, right? Right. Well, to some extent, but again, the choice of language and how you describe things tends to be pretty similar as well. Again, sometimes in comical ways, sometimes in ways that I can understand. I guess the more... I don't know, maybe comical is the wrong word to describe it. But I remember an article when one of the hostage exchanges occurred, right, where they did this in batches of 10, Mm -hmm. where Israel would release prisoners and uh, Hamas would release hostages in, in response. And there was an article in the BBC that described the prisoners coming back home to their parents and to their loved ones, et cetera, with no mention of the hostages and with no mention of what those prisoners did that ended with them in prison to begin with, right? Which when I just Googled the names of these people, I saw, oh, 10 years for attempted murder. 
aren't you supposed to mention that, that we're exchanging a hostage who did nothing here for somebody who was in prison, who was actually convicted of a crime, right? That seems like if the number one rule is tell the truth, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's worth mentioning. But that actually leads me to the next question, which is tell the truth. But typically in other contexts, we say, and nothing by the truth and the entire truth, right? But here it's just tell the truth. So no, it's it's seek the truth and report it as fully as okay. possible. Uh, okay, so but let, let me try to ask then, is there still a danger that within those rules, I can seek whichever truth I want to report about and not whichever truth is most important for the reader to know about? I mean, that is, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And um, that's sort of how why we're in this very polarized situation in the United States, maybe in the entire world is because Mm -hmm. we have had a proliferation of media organizations that, that tailor the way they seek the truth for a specific audience, sometimes to the point, and sometimes to the point of misinformation, right? Like there's always, um, there's always tailoring your product for your audience, right? Like the Wall Street Journal is not for everybody, right? It's for people who are specifically in business. You know, it's, it's a, um, yeah, it's a targeted publication, right? The Associated Press is more like for everybody. It's so tricky, right? Because, because it's very hard to say that you're for everybody because you, you only have so many resources and you have to pick the, how you're going to deploy those resources. What stories are you going to do? How many stories are you going to do about those topics? How many people are you going to interview? How long, how long are you going to stick on that story? I mean, just look at the difference now between covering the war in Ukraine and covering what's happening in Gaza, right? Where arguably what's going on in Ukraine is much more of a threat to the entire world, right? Like that is, it is destabilizing to the entire world order, Mm -hmm. um, running the risk of nuclear war at any given moment, although it seems like it's less now than it was maybe a year ago or so. but you know, every news organization has had to say, okay, we can't put as many resources into Ukraine and we're going to put more resources into Israel and Gaza. And then they've also, they also recognize that their audiences are only going to consume so much conflict news and people may be more, people may be more interested in what's going on in Israel and Gaza because everybody has a political view about that. And in Ukraine, um, it's just not as controversial. Well, it's not as controversial and not as much as changing day to day. So maybe it is becoming less newsworthy just because the front lines haven't moved from last week. And by the way, I have to disclose that, first of all, I'm Israeli. I figured and that second, out. Yeah, and that second wasn't, of all, it wasn't I, a surprise. Right, right. And second of all, I'm the co-founder of a startup that's currently manufacturing weapons for Ukraine. So... <laughs> <laughs> Are you really? So, yes. Um, <laughs> software for autonomous uh, software for autonomous drones. The startup is called Swarmer. Oh wow! Um, right. So I'm involved in both of these, right? But I do recognize that at some point a conflict becomes stale. There's just no new stuff happening, right? And Ukraine, be- it was really scary initially. I had my go pack ready so that I can load everything. And I had a, a map routed for where do I take my family in case I know stuff has been launched, right? That was in the beginning of the conflict. And today, nobody cares because the, the frog has been boiling for two years, right? And well, so nothing- and, but <laughs> yeah. I would argue that, yeah, people, um, consumers lose their appetite for the details of conflict, right? Um, but but that it, when that happens, that's when you start to see um, war crimes, when you start to see official bodies shirking their duties. And, and I think that's probably happening in both sides. 
It is. And I would say it happens even more in conflicts that everybody just seems to ignore right now, right? Everybody talks about Israel and Ukraine, which are the two that you mentioned. There are pretty big conflicts happening all over Africa right now that not only are journalists not talking about that much, the UN isn't looking at them that much, mm -hmm. right? Even though that's their entire mandate to basically seek out the worst abuses, right? But the worst abuses right now are not in Ukraine and not in Israel, Gaza. They're happening elsewhere in the world, but it seems like nobody cares because it's not newsworthy, I guess. I mean, I think um, obviously the Western world dominates the UN just like it dominates everything. And so I think that I think it's very hard um, and I don't and I will not even pretend to understand the UN. Right. That is way beyond my expertise. All right. Uh, let me try to look at another version of the same question, which is it feels like, especially in the past 20 years, journalists have been facing this conflict between what is most worth reporting about and what makes them money or what makes money for the outlet. Right. You want to write about the thing that is most important to your reader, but you're incentivized to write about the thing that will get the most clicks and shares, which is often not the same thing. And so maybe in part that explains why before the midterm election in 2018, Fox News was basically showing migrant caravans every day. Right. Maybe there is a political purpose there, but maybe this is just what sells for, for that audience. And a journalist might want to cover something else. But he's seeing the ratings <laughs> and the ratings say migrant caravans sell. So is there an ethical question here or should there be an ethics rule here that says and focus on reporting what is important to the reader and not what makes you money? Well, what there should be is a really clear promise between the newsroom and its audience. And this is lacking in many, many newsrooms. Um, I think um, some newsrooms have gotten a lot better about it. But every newsroom has a mission. And, and, and as they describe that mission to their audience, it should include some promises about what they will cover and what they won't cover. So, so that's one thing, right? Um, and um, I'm pretty sure that Fox News promises its audience that they will cover issues and stories that are important to that audience that mainstream news does not cover. So by definition, they are, they are going to go after stories and, and go after them more vigorously and feature them more frequently than mainstream news organizations may do. However, the, I think the, the, the challenge is when you start actually distorting the truth which we know Fox News has done, right? I mean, the Dominion case exposed a lot, right? Like we know that, um, that there are times when they distort the truth. Now, there are times when lots of news organizations distort the truth because of their choices. And I'll give you an example based on a project that I've spent a lot of time on. So I used to be a police reporter and I currently have a project. It's in its third year. It's called Transforming Crime Reporting into Public Safety journalism. And I take newsrooms, usually about 25 at a time, through a process where, where I try and get them to rethink how they cover crime. Because for the most part, the way news organizations cover crime is by covering incidents of crime, right? So here's a homicide, here's a knifing, here's a mass shooting, here's another homicide. And what they don't do is tell their audience, whether crime is going up or going down. And in fact, what happens is for the most part, if you look over time at any news budget, television station, newspaper, um, the, the amount of time and space that they spend on crime stories stays relatively the same. When you throw in the internet, it expands, right? So like mid 2000s, we saw like a 700% jump in the number of crime stories because the internet became a thing. The result is, is that the public perceives that crime is always, always, always going up, which is not the truth, right? Crime goes up, crime goes down. Um, 
the raw numbers change, the rate especially changes, right? Like as, as cities get bigger and the amount of crime either stays the same or de- declines in raw numbers, the rate goes down significantly, the number of homicides per 100,000 people in a city or a market. And the public never gets that story. They never, they never understand whether crime is really going up or going down. Um, and then there are a bunch of other forces, right? Politicians love to talk about crime going up. And when reporters quote them saying those things without fact-checking them, it feeds that narrative. So that's a choice. We know that the public likes crime stories. Now, they don't love crime stories. The, the average crime story doesn't get a lot of clicks. Certain crime stories are very sensational. They get a lot of clicks. But most of the time, the average crime story does a moderate amount of audience for most news organizations. But they're so reliable that over time, if you do 10 of them a week, that's going to that's gonna add to your audience base. Um, and, and, you know, my point when I work with newsrooms is you got to own the fact that you're distorting the narrative over time. You got to own that um, that that in choosing to tell the homicides that are closest to your station and not the homicides that are out in the rural area of your market, that that you've done two things. One is you've made people think crime is going up over time. You've also made people think that that homicide is exclusively a problem for um, the 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 most dense parts of your city um, and that it doesn't happen in rural areas when in fact it's actually rising most in rural areas. Um, and, and a lot of times you've implied that it's a problem um, in communities of color. Um, now communities of color in some cities are disproportionately affected by crime, but the public has very little um, nuanced understanding of the differences in all those different shades. And that's because as, as journalists, we don't tell a nuanced story about crime. We just take a press release from the police department and shove it into the news report because we know it will get some audience and because that's how we do it. It's a habit that we have. So there's lots of examples where we don't minimize harm. Yeah, I I wanted to kind of build on what you said and add another example, which is perhaps not with homicides, but one of the things that is most apparent to somebody coming from another country to the U.S. is that children can't walk to school or to the park to play by themselves for the most part. And it's very unusual everywhere else in the world. Children as little as seven or eight year old take the bus to go somewhere. They go to school by themselves just with their backpack, et cetera. And here, everybody has been scared into submission that their child is going to be abducted, right? And I'm thinking this is primarily, it seems, well, the faces on milk cartons, I guess, play the role. But for the most part, it's the media talking about this and politicians talking about this when the problem is essentially non-existent and there is no risk. Well, I mean, and that that's an old problem, right? So that happened in the 1980s. Right. It's really interesting because I have children who are now adults um, and I was very aware of like what the risk was to them. And I let them walk to school and let them go to the park, let them have I was like the first free range parent in the United States because I was a free range parent before it was a term. However, the the thing that you're discounting there is that our public policy penalizes parents now. There's there's many many examples of people letting their kids do something and then somebody calling in authorities and those authorities deeming that that parent is negligent. Um so so the initial the initial narrative that children are at risk was overblown for sure. And that happened decades ago. As a result of that, we have created public policies and practices that penalize parents for not not acknowledging that non-existent risk. Those policies and practices, I mean, I suppose as a journalist, you could do stories about it, but um, that's, you know, child protective services, law enforcement, schools, even. I, d- I don't know how you unwind all that, but that's really why nowadays 
it's not because there's a lot of stories about children being kidnapped anymore, because you're right, it is virtually non-existent. I think, though, maybe this is the idealist in me, but I think that public policy does respond to what the public believes, at least some of the time. And so if public policy is to act as if this is a clear and present danger and parents need to be penalized if they subject their kids to this danger, that's mostly because people actually believe that it's a, it's a clear and present danger, right? And plus, there's neighbors calling the cops on those kids playing in the park, right? It's not like the cops just showed up by themselves. So it seems like a large number of people still think the risk exists. The risk exists. Well, I think public policy res- responds to the um, lowest common denominator in terms of risk tolerance. So I don't yeah. think it has to be the general public perception. Um, I think it it can be the squeaky wheel. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with that. All right. So you wrote your book in 2014. And what we haven't talked about is the past 10 years. How did things change, right? From especially the past eight years, because it seemed like journalists have changed their policies quite a bit around 2016 in response to what has happened. How so? What do you so, what do you think happened? And I mean, obviously Trump was elected, but what do you think well, what do you yeah. think changed? In journalism. Well, Trump was elected and journal. Well, one thing is headlines that say Trump lied. I don't think those headlines were very common before that with other politicians, right? It seems like, and there has been discussion about this among journalists, to call him out more directly than they called out anybody else in the past because he lies more, right? And therefore, we need to call it out. It was a change in journalistic policy, No, right? well, I mean, no. And I, it's actually not easy to find those Trump lied headlines even now, but the, here's how the conversation went. Right. Um, so Trump is a candidate unlike any others as a politician, as a president, as a public figure. Um, and Mm -hmm. as journalists were covering him in 2015 and in the run up to the election in 2016, they did that thing where, um, you cover the most outrageous thing that someone says. And because he's always saying Mm -hmm. outrageous things, he garnered a disproportionate amount of the coverage. Um, And so that was, um, that was an, that was an example of journalists of sort of the tail wagging the dog, right? The journalists were reacting to this person who, who we already knew was really good at manipulating media coverage And so they didn't necessarily stick to their strategies for covering the races in a fair way. And as a result, Trump just got a hugely disproportionate amount of coverage. And it wasn't always the information that citizens needed to know in order to vote. The second thing that happened, though, is they gave the microphone to him a lot and they would they didn't always make it clear when he was distorting the truth that he was distorting the truth. This is early in 2016. And there was a lot of criticism of that. There were a lot of people who said, you know, you are failing to tell the truth by quoting him, by saying this is his response to this, um, by letting him make claims that, you know, Mexicans coming from um, or or migrants coming from Mexico are all rapists and pedophiles, distorting, distorting the truth. Um, You know, like if you just look at when somebody leaked a story about him calling a bunch of countries shithole countries, right, that that coverage didn't. It, it was really hard for people to say, you know, there's one thing that all these countries have in common is that they're poor and black or brown, right? And so there was pressure to be more precise and less coded in the language. So if he says something that is racist, mm-hmm. or if he says something that you clearly know he knows is false, then that's when you say he's lying or that's, or, or he's saying something that's racist. But that actually is 
those in those episodes are few and far between, right? Because oftentimes you don't know if he really doesn't know what the truth is or if he you've got to have evidence that like somebody told him the truth, right? We found a bunch of stuff around COVID because of the Bob Woodward interviews. But it's really hard in real time to nail down whether he knows that something whether he knows that it that he's lying or not. And so it's more important to not perpetuate falsehoods. And I think journalists, I think journalists got, I think they got a little less caught up in the conventions of political coverage, which is here's one side, here's another side, you figure it out, audience, and started getting um, just, you know, here's what we know are the facts. And this is why we know this isn't true. And just not even quoting him as saying things that aren't true. So let me play devil's advocate here. Wouldn't it be better if you just quoted Trump saying something obviously false? Wouldn't it be better to now bring in somebody else and quote them correcting Trump than the journalists themselves trying to do the correction and by doing that, essentially becoming the anti-Trump in the story, right? There's a danger when a journalist goes from reporting the claim and the debunking of the claim to being the debunker of the claim themselves, no? Oh, I totally disagree. I think that it's really important if somebody if, if somebody is saying something that isn't true and the journalist factually knows that that isn't true, then they should say, this isn't true and here's how we know this isn't true, right? Like, like why every time Trump says the election was stolen, how is it a service to the audience to go and find somebody that's a false equivalency, right? No, I, I almost think like in that case, you should quote Bob Barr saying that all of these claims were false. And that's a much better debunking of Trump than the journalists saying. I, it, I don't right? think, I think the audience doesn't want to work that hard. I think they just want to know what the truth is. Well, it's possible. I'm just worried that in this case, the audience will actually not trust the journalist, right? Because it seems like the journalist is becoming a side in the conflict. Yeah, I think you have to be, I think this goes back to your promise to the audience, um, mm -hmm. right? Which is, um, we're going to call out everybody when they are telling you things that aren't true. Um, and then you've got to point to examples where you do it. I mean, they do it for Biden. They did it for Hillary Clinton. Um, they do it for lots of people. They do it a lot for Trump. Yeah. And it does create the perception that, and again, we're seeing this with less trust in media these days, right? Uh, I think it creates the perception that the journalists themselves have a side, right? That they are fighting for one of the sides as opposed to being the referee and just trying to bring in the best fighter to beat this guy if they think he's lying, which is what I would expect would probably be the more convincing strategy, even just on from a utilitarian perspective, right? You're seeing somebody who's obviously a good media fighter, doing something bad and punching people who shouldn't be punched, bring in the Mike Tyson from the other side and let them punch that guy. I mean, that actually is the old way of doing it. And um, it, it, I don't know that I, the audience didn't respond. They got tired of that. I think in addition to that, I mean, what we know about audience trust is that um, audience trust started declining way, way, way before 2016, right? It actually started declining right. in the late 1970s and it declined for a number of reasons. It declined because the media wasn't diverse, right? So people who didn't look like the people on TV um, were like, well, I don't trust that. It declined because people started to lose trust in all institutions, right? The government, the church, schools, universities, clubs and, and, and other, um, civil civic or organizations. So there, you know, that was sort of like, that's what postmodernism was all about. And so the decline in trust has, has, is wrapped up in a lot. And I, I actually think that from what I've seen, when the public has a clear relationship with a news organization, and, and they see that news organization fulfilling the promise of what they say they're going to do, they actually gain trust. The other problem with those, with those polls is that they always ask people, do you trust the media? 
And so mm-hmm. if I'm responding to that, that means they're asking me, do I trust the New York Times, Fox News, National Public Radio, CNN, the Associated Press, the Wall Street Journal, Breitbart, right? Do I trust all the media? And so if you ask me that, the answer is like, well, no, I don't. Like there's some really shady characters in there, right? When you ask them, do you specifically trust specific media organizations? They actually have like, there's, there's a clear distinction, right? And, and some organizations tend to rank much, much higher than other organizations. And, and among those, it is the, the organizations that rank the highest generally are PBS and NPR. Um, and the reason that they rank so high is because they do have a sometimes annoyingly fair approach to the news. And, and they, they both PBS and NPR have, have improved the conciseness with which they describe the political rhetoric. And, and the audience, I think, clearly appreciates that. I had a funny moment where I was actually commenting on a story for Fox News at some point, and they asked me, which media outlets do I consider to be the most credible on that particular topic, which is uh, deep fake video, right? And I told them, well, typically financial outlets, because if they get it wrong, their readers lose money. Right. <laughs> but I don't think Fox News liked that answer, so they didn't, uh, they, they didn't air that particular answer. C- CNBC <laughs> actually has um, incredibly high ratings as well. And that's, yeah, it's the same thing, right? And they score really high on our platform as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. Because we, we typically, we do the anti-news guard thing where news guard ranks outlets, right? We rank every single article as if we don't know who wrote it. And then we try to calculate the rankings of the outlets just based on an average of the articles. And so we do see financial outlets scoring very high just because they have an incentive to get it right. Yeah. And it's also, um, I mean, it's also, it's more black and white, right? Like what they cover, right? It's numbers. I mean, a lot of them cover everything. So um, if I go to the Financial Times right now, I will find stories about Israel, Gaza. I will find stories about Ukraine. But it seems like they're just trying to state what they know and not to state what they're not sure about. Which is which is a great practice, right? Like that really yep. is. I I think the other thing that's happened in media is the amount of speculation and especially in political coverage, right? Like who's Mm -hmm. gonna win? That's what everybody wants to focus on. And the truth is, is that like, you don't know who's gonna win. There's no way to know the answer to that question until the votes are actually counted. You can do polls and what the polls will tell you is who would win if the vote was taken today and all these people who answered the polls did exactly what they told the pollsters they were going to do, which is not the same question as who's going to win the election. So we spend, we do as a profession, spend way too much time talking about what might happen as opposed to what has happened. Yeah, well, what has happened is sometimes minor. What might happen is very large. And so if you tie those two together, your ratings are higher, right? (laughs) But yeah, I guess I read a lot of, Maybe I don't know. I don't know that it's proven that your ratings are higher, right? Like the financial organizations have pretty yeah, high ratings. No, I, I mean, that's true. Um, I, I, when you said we don't know who's going to win, my immediate thought was, but Nate Silver does. That's <laughs> it's a whole cottage industry for him, right? Like that's what he does. Is yes. he sort of like he was supposed to be the new and better improved polling, but that was a result of this this thought that like, oh my God, we need to tell people what's going to happen. Um, Unless yeah. it's the weather. And that only works about three days out. <laughs> it's good to know, though. Yeah. Um, all right. So I guess we talked a little bit about what changed. What do you think is going to change now that AI is becoming a part of news content gradually? God, everything. I mean, <laughs> I think so. One thing is, is the financial model is going to continue to deteriorate, Right. And um, news organizations that are relying on anything other than subscriptions are just going to be in a world of hurt. And that's most of them, right? Um, And I think it's particularly true of broadcast. So I think the financial model is going to continue to be disrupted. I don't think it's going to be disrupted like a water faucet being shut off, but I think it's going to be a slow and painful tightening 
for a long time. And it already has been, right? So that's going to continue and accelerate. I think the other thing that's going to change is um, we're going to be able to personalize the news a lot more. We're going to be able to understand from consumers what they really want based on their geography, their past habits. And we're going to be able to create news for them. And that may further isolate us from each other, right? Because part of the reason that we have the polarization that we have is, is people are consuming different dominant narratives. And, and there's, there's mainly like two different dominant narratives right now. But what happens if there's 10,000 different dominant narratives? That could really create a disruption in the political stability of the country. AI is really going to accelerate that. The internet has already done this. Um, and I think AI will further do this. There's this thing that the internet did that made like a lot of news really mediocre. It drove it toward the middle. So like, think about the headline, right? You'll never guess what happened next, right? Like, like that was clever for like two minutes and then it was annoying and then it became absolutely ridiculous and stupid. Um, and some people still use it. But the reason that it became such a um, device on the internet is because people could see it and adopt it quickly. And it, it created a lot of imitation, right? So that's going to just happen for everything, right? Like AI, yeah. um, I've been experimenting a lot with AI. And um, mm -hmm. it's really interesting because like, if I ask AI to write something, it's, it's pretty boring. If I ask it to improve something that I've written, I think it makes it worse. Um, I think yep. it makes it, it makes it more bureaucratic. It takes words that I have used that are really unique and punchy and makes them, we talk about as writers, we talk about the ladder of abstraction, right? And the most powerful mm -hmm. language is down at the bottom of the ladder of abstraction, right? Words mm -hmm. that are super concrete and make you think of a, specific physical thing in the world and then words that are way at the top of the ladder of abstraction which are really cool abstract metaphors anything in the middle is really boring and ai drives all writing to the middle of the ladder of abstraction so um i think i think people are going to use ai for writing right and and i think it's going to make the news more boring so I will give you, I don't know if it's hope or kind of the opposite. I don't know. But I can tell you that when you say that you've tried AI, you didn't try all of AI. You essentially tried a few products that did their reinforcement learning through human feedback from students in Kenya or other places where if you're a student, it doesn't even matter where you are. Chances are you're mostly writing to impress somebody to get an A. Right. And that's what creates this kind of style of writing. And so, yes, with chat GPT, it doesn't even matter how I prompt it. It doesn't even matter if I use the API and I try to really give it specific instructions on how to write. It always writes like a student trying to get an A, which is this bad, boring writing that you're describing. But if I take Llama 3, an open source model, and I fine tune it on 100 articles from The New York Times, it's going to write like the New York Times. It's going to write like the New York Times has already written. What? In the style of the New York Times. Now there's going to be, my, my personal prediction this, as an AI guy, is that there's going to be a separation between content and style, right? Somebody has to decide what to write about, what is true and what is false, what facts are worth describing. And obviously AI is completely useless at that, right? But then you have a list of bullet points, turn that into an article, I think AI is going to become better than humans at that. Mm, I don't know. I think that I will always be able to detect AI. In fact, I can see it a lot now. Like um, a lot of times I'll be reading something and I'll wonder why it's so bad. And then I'll inquire and I'll be like, did you guys use AI on this? And I'll be like, oh, yeah, we did. It's like, got it. Yeah, well, there's a few tools that can detect that automatically. And as long as the AI is specifically from one of the popular big ones, from OpenAI, from, from Google, or from Anthropic, 
then you can detect it pretty easily with those tools. I mean, I can detect yes, it by just, reading it, right? Yeah, I don't, you don't need yeah. a computer to detect it. Exactly, you just right. need to actually read a lot to detect it. But but it's because of specific bad habits that those tools have, right? With OpenAI, you know it's going to say delve when it's not supposed to. You know it's going to say in the realm of in the beginning of sentences. But and, the thing <laughs> is, is like even when I'm reading the New York Times... I can tell you who the good writers are and the bad writers are at the New York Times. And I can even sometimes detect which editor edited a story because I know their habits, right? And so when the New York Times really hits it out of the park with a piece of writing, mm -hmm. which is exceptional, right? Like, like I don't think AI is ever going to be able to do that. I think they'll be able to imitate, yeah, the general New York Times, because even the New York Times can't imitate the best of the New York Times because it's hard mm -hmm. and because it requires a, an amazing alignment of circumstances, right? The right person, the right facts, the right narrative, the right inspiration, the right moment in time, the right editor, like you you're not going to be able to control for all of that. Okay, so I think we'll have to revisit this discussion in a couple of years because my personal prediction is like this is a 1996 moment and you're saying computers will never beat humans at chess and then 1997 is going to happen, right? So I think we're a year away. It didn't ruin chess <laughs> though, right? Like people are still no, playing chess. No, it didn't chess. ruin chess. No, people are still playing chess. Now there's a lot of concerns about cheating, right? But we even got full circle. And this is me geeking out because I used to play chess a lot, right? Chess computers between 97 and roughly 2018, 19, right? They played better than humans, but they played like computers. You could tell it's a computer playing better than a human. And then Alpha Zero happened. You still happened. can. You still can. I mean, I have a chess coach and we will play a computer and we will play a computer. Right. But you don't think no, no, I just what, no, no. What, what I'm saying is there's a specific program which was done by a Google subsidiary, DeepMind, called Alpha Zero, that basically beat all chess computers and then stopped playing, right? So you can't play it, you can't experience what it's like. But as a chess player, I look at Alpha Zero games, it looks like the best human game ever, and I just don't remember it for some reason from my childhood. But it looks almost like a conglomeration of Geller, Spassky, Fisher all in one. It doesn't look like a computer playing anymore. So I think that stage also comes, but it comes 20 years after the point at which AI becomes better than humans at something. I want to fast forward to one specific question that I've had in my mind for a very long time, and we kind of already touched upon the topic of personalization and the dangers of personalizing based on the wrong traits to the point where you're basically creating an echo chamber for everyone. One of the problems that I tried to solve for a very long time is the like-dislike problem, right? If people see a story and they like it or they dislike it, and I just personalize based on that, chances are I'm going to end up with an echo chamber created just for them, right? Because Let's say there is a story that says Trump indicted for corruption, and I like it. Is that because I like the topic of corruption in politics, or is that because I dislike Trump? Right. And my question is, is it possible to decouple those and only personalize based on the traits that will lead me to topics that interest me without also leading me to only the viewpoints that I like? I mean, I'm sure it is. The question is, is it profitable? Right. Like, I bet you could create I bet people I bet there are some people who would pay for that. And there are some people who would pay for the exact opposite of that. Right. Everybody's looking for the better mousetrap. Right. Like, especially in the era of news fatigue. Right. Like everybody like people don't want to consume news anymore. They're tired of it. And we're seeing it in the numbers. Um you know, it's the it's literally the weirdest election year ever because con news consumers are behaving so weird. Like, you know, we're talking on the night of the first debate, the CNN debate between Trump and Biden. And I'll be really interested to see who like how many people even watch that debate and if it's more than predicted or less than predicted. Like, can we create like like if you think about news, like you think about nutrition. Like, can we learn about what actually harms us 
And can we teach people to minimize that in their diets, either through coaching or through offering them better products or through regulation or, or through monitoring, like giving them a, like, like, like you've consumed like 50% of your news calories from junk food. You need to. So you're talking to somebody who put nutrition labels on articles. So I know, (laughs) I know, I know, (laughs) but like, but like, can we, can you incentivize it? Right. Like, like there's nutrition labels on everything and people still eat a lot of junk food. Right. People do. Like, and, and I see people reading articles, even though it says attention grabbing headline. Yes. In our nutrition label. Exactly. People still read right? it. <laughs> like, that's the thing is like um, people don't always do what's in their best self-interest. Have you read? Um, oh, God. What's his name? His last name. Charles Taylor's new book. It just came out on um, the Canadian philosopher. No. I mean, he he makes this argument that essentially like art will save us, right? That it is the the emotions and the the otherworldly experiences that that are going to become the only true things in the universe. Um, but I don't. I mean, I don't know one if I actually believe them. But two, I just don't know. I don't know how you first of all decide what's good for everybody, right? Like. What's good for you as a news consumer or as a person who eats food is not going to be the same thing that's good for me, right? Because we have different needs and we do, we have different psychologies. We do different things and we both probably make choices that aren't healthy for ourselves. And so I just don't know. I I mean, what you want to do mostly is you want to incentivize the market to Mm -hmm. create healthy options. And then you want to educate people to choose the options that will be best for them. And I, I, I don't know that we even once, if even in a perfect world, if people would really do what's best for themselves. Yeah, well, figuring out how to incentivize the market, I guess, is the economist's work. But uh, the ethicist work is to define what is best. <laughs> And so I'm trying to get mm, to the point. Of, I, that's I would say that's not the ethicist's work. What is it? The then? ethicist's work is to describe and en- especially in journalism, is to mm-hmm. describe and encourage a process to get the the best possible product that you can get. Um, but but the inputs, the definition of best is going to be different yeah. for every for every news organization based on their promise to their audience. And the part I'm trying to perhaps avoid with especially AI making content creation so cheap is the idea that if the end condition of this endless customization and fragmentation is that every article is written just for you, (laughs) for an audience of one, right? How do we get to a world where just for you means using vocabulary that is easy for you to understand, using a link that kind of fits your daily schedule and things like that. And it doesn't mean using facts that you might like. Right. right? That's kind of where I'm trying to get to. Yeah. <laughs> facts that you might like or facts that aren't facts. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> That's the, I mean, maybe even not facts that you don't like, but literally it doesn't it doesn't so selectively choose the information that what you end up is uh, with is a distortion of the world, which is, which has happened already without AI, right? Like we've already talked Mm -hmm. about with crime coverage, how that's already happened. How do we keep it from happening all the time? How do we keep it from being the primary business model essentially is just to reinforce your biases, for example. Yeah or just to give you the thing that gets you the most outraged because then you're more likely to share it with your friends who will also be outraged. We already have that though too. That already exists. We do. We do, but as the cost of a product goes down, (laughs) you get more of it. Well, but, but what you also get is the consumer behavior though, right? Like I think that people, one of the reasons that we are in this world where consumers are turning away from the news is because we've exploited their emotional experience. Right. And so Mm -hmm. they're just saying, I'm not going to, I don't want to, I don't want to do that anymore. And they're also doing the same thing on a variety of social media platforms. 
Not TikTok though, right? Like TikTok yeah. has figured out how to make them feel good. So whatever that TikTok algorithm is, that's what's really going to kill us. And, and there's also a confounding factor in here, which is I suspect that a lot of people that say they don't consume the news anymore are actually consuming news on TikTok. They just don't call it news. <laughs> right. I mean, but what we see is like the actual news articles, people are consuming fewer of those. Like mm -hmm. we see that. Yes across yeah. the board. And you see that on in every single measurement, whether it's a broadcast measurement, a radio measurement, an internet measurement. Though that is also only true in some countries, not in others. If you look at Finland, then the graph is much less steep, right? So it's it seems like some countries have had it worse than others in this regard. Well, the more polarized the country, the more the worse the the alienation is from news. Right? Like yeah. Finland isn't very polarized. Yeah, and trust in the news is at 73% in Finland. Mm -hmm. It's at 42 in the US or something mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, I don't think we're going to become Finland anytime soon, but here's to trying. <laughs> so Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. This has been great. Um, I apologize if it got a little bit contentious at times, but I guess that's ethics. It has to be interesting, right? I didn't get contentious at all. Um, we just disagree on some things, which is fine. And I, I'm not even sure that we disagree. I have a tendency to just take the other side of whatever is being said, just to figure out if we can poke at it and see if it still holds. Well, that's a healthy, that's a healthy way to get smarter, right? Like I like doing that too sometimes. Um, yeah. Either, either get smarter or just be a smart ass. I'm one of the two. Yeah, or a pain <laughs> in the ass. Exactly. All right. Thank you so much.